As Gaza is being ethnically cleansed by Israel, tens of thousands of Palestinians have been killed and about two million have been displaced. These are unprecedented numbers. But one cannot fully comprehend these events without understanding the underlying philosophy and political intent of this genocide. And more importantly, in order to know how to most effectively fight against it and the imperialist powers supporting and relying on it, no matter where you live, it is key to know about the concrete history and essence of the ideology at the core of this dreadful catastrophe. In the 1880s, European seekers of wealth and expansion reached a high point of colonial annexation during the so-called scramble for Africa. In order to generate bigger profits than in the saturated home markets, bank and industrial capital began to merge and export investment into the global south to compete against their fellow imperialists for foreign markets and resources. It was during these frenzied times of conquest when the beginning of Zionist colonization of Palestine was inspired. The guy on this famous illustration of that period's colonialism is called Cecil Rhodes, one of the most powerful capitalists and colonialists of the 19th century, founder of the De Beers diamond mining monopoly, which profited off the apartheid system in South Africa. The ambitious British industrialist and politician thought the British were the first race of the world and envisioned a united American British empire. Through the British South Africa Company, he would colonize the territories in southern Africa for the British. One of these, later called Rhodesia, a land governed by white settler Europeans, would be named after him, until it was abolished and renamed to Zimbabwe in 1980. When the founder of political Zionism campaigned among the ruling classes in Europe, he wrote a letter to Rhodes telling him, quote, You are being invited to help make history. It doesn't involve Africa, but a piece of Asia Minor, not Englishmen, but Jews. How then do I happen to turn to you, since this is an out-of-the-way matter for you? How indeed? Because it is something colonial. You, Mr. Rhodes, are a visionary politician. I want you to put the stamp of your authority on the Zionist plan. It is a plan full of culture, and quite good, for England, for Greater Britain. Israel would later sell weapons to the white Rhodesian government during the Rhodesian Bosch War. Settlers of the world, unite. He tried to convince the British Empire in particular, emphasizing their common colonial benefits, that a Jewish state in Palestine would, quote, form a part of a wall of defense for Europe in Asia, an outpost of civilization against barbarism. Now, back then, being a colonialist was considered something cool among Europeans. It was in vogue. All the famous Zionists were proud to be labeled as such. Nowadays, it's not so fashionable anymore. Zionists and their partners rebranded their colonial project as a progressive, gay and vegan-friendly endeavor, as something decolonial. Here's the German newspaper Tagesspiegel writing that Zionism is in truth not something colonial, but something decolonial. Another important new idea at the time was the doctrine of nationalism which swept across Europe. Various versions of it gained hold among European intellectuals and the upper classes. One such version was ethno-nationalism, which stresses common ethnic ancestry. Countries like Russia, Poland, Hungary and Germany would perceive themselves as distinct tribes, in conflict or under threat from other nation tribes. Their aim was to establish a racially pure space reflecting the so-called authentic spirit of the nation. Zionism would mirror the form of ethno-nationalism prevalent in Central and Eastern Europe, and the idea that Jewish people cannot possibly be part of those countries as a minority alien body. They could only thrive as a part of a country's majority. <laughs> 
Charles Joseph of Ling, a field marshal of Austria-Hungary, stated in the 18th century, quote, I believe that the Jew is not able to assimilate and that he will constantly constitute a nation within a nation, wherever he may be. The simplest thing to do would, in my opinion, be returning to them, their homeland, from which they were driven. Some Jewish intellectuals, not at all orthodox in their religious beliefs, accepted the ethno-nationalist premise of the anti-Semites. Isaiah Jabotinsky, the founder of revisionist Zionism, the current later giving rise to right-wing parties such as Netanyahu's Likud, stated that the creation of a Jewish majority was the fundamental aim of Zionism, since the term Jewish state means a Jewish majority, and Palestine will become a Jewish country at the moment when it has a Jewish majority. Most perversely, many Jewish nationalists began to theorize that there are alleged racial bonds among Jews which would constitute them as a nationality with the usual national rights, including a right to a territory of their own. Moses Hess, an early thinker of Jewish nationalism, wrote, quote, Jews are first of all a race. We saw the rise of a perverted Jewish nationalist hope that maybe DNA could provide conclusive evidence of a migrating Jewish ethnos of common origin that eventually arrived in the land of Israel. To this day, we see instances of this, like the rabbis in Israel requiring DNA tests in order to determine if they're allowed to marry. As we know, Jewish people cannot marry people of another faith in Israel. Of course, the other group trying to determine Jews by their blood that comes to mind are the so-called scientific anti-Semites of the European fascists. It's also interesting that it's difficult to do an ancestry DNA test without court order, otherwise the myth that settlers are from the Levant instead of Europe or New York might break the myth that the settlers are indigenous to the region. Before the emergence of Jewish nationalism or Zionism in Europe during the early 20th century, Jews, much like other groups, did not identify themselves as a distinct nation in the modern sense, and most certainly not on a global scale. Zionism threatened the natural belonging of many Jews to the countries where they lived. Jewish minister in the British government, Edwin Montagu, complained, quote, The country for which I have worked ever since I left the university, England, the country for which my family have fought, tells me that my national home is Palestine. Jewish people in the so-called Pale of Settlement in the western region of the Russian Empire were mostly forbidden to seek employment or permanent residency outside that region. Revolts against the Tsar reached their high point when Tsar Alexander II got assassinated by Narodnaya Volya in 1881. A counter-revolutionary onslaught followed, framing the bad economic conditions and the assassination as part of a Jewish conspiracy. Later, Narodnaya Volya tried to kill Tsar Alexander III. The older brother of Vladimir Lenin, Alexander Ulyanov, was involved, but the plot failed and he was hanged. The traumatic experience of violent pogroms resulted in widespread displacement and fleeing. But most Jews didn't emigrate to Palestine, but to the United States and Western Europe, where Jewish people could lead relatively better lives due to the French Revolution and so on. They had no desire whatsoever to move to a place that had a radically different climate and environment. Although repression of Jews in the 19th century added to Zionism's appeal, Zionism did not emerge simply because of it, as is often portrayed. As professor for Jewish history Michael Stanislavski explains, the first expressions of this new ideology were published well before the spread of the new anti-Semitic ideology and before the pogroms of the early 1880s. The fundamental cause of the emergence of modern Jewish nationalism was the rise, on the part of Jews themselves, of new ideologies that applied the basic tenets of modern nationalism to the Jews and not a response to persecution. Moreover, only a small minority of Jews in Eastern Europe adopted Zionism as a way to liberate themselves. There was another ideology emerging, far more popular among the oppressed Jewish people, which would propel them to emancipate themselves where they lived and to contribute to a world historic revolution that would arrive soon revolutionary socialism. In order to create the new nation, it was crucial to determine a national language, which was Hebrew, which hitherto had been more of a lingua franca, while different Jewish communities had their own language. But these components of the new nationalism were not enough. What had been missing was the creation of a new state. <laughs>
and it was in a certain city in Switzerland where the first structure of the future Israeli state was born, led by a certain man from Austria who would become known as the father of political Zionism. If you look at the official website of the Israeli Foreign Ministry regarding the history of Palestine, it would appear as if the magnificent economic flourishing was concentrated in the Jewish communities. Then, if you believe official state history, which is also taught in school, it appears as if Palestine became a desert land in the 19th century as the Ottoman rule declined in quality, suggesting that the local Arab population was incompetent in managing that desolate area which only came to thrive again under Zionist leadership. This narrative, which is also prevalent in the West, reminds of the empty land theory propagated by European settlers in 19th century South Africa to justify the white, supposedly civilized Afrikaners' claims to the land. In truth, however, research shows that Palestine, far from being a desert, was a thriving Arab society. Toward the latter half of the 19th century, about half a million Arab-speaking people lived in the land of Palestine, then under the rule of the Ottoman Empire. They spoke Arabic, most were Muslims, who lived in peaceful coexistence with Christians, who made up about 10%, and with 15,000 Jewish people, about 3% of the population. The vast majority of people still lived in rural areas. Palestine's economy was mainly agricultural. As the incorporation of Palestine into the world economy proceeded, it accelerated the dissolving of traditional customs. Though studies show the so-called modernization of Palestine's economy, the emergence of private property relations and generalized commodity exchange, which also weakened the power of the elite families and which led to the improvement of the status of women, began long before the arrival of the Europeans. They did not invent the progress. Palestine became a distinct economic center, subject neither to Cairo or Beirut. It was no longer just biblical Palestine. After the Paris Congress ended the Crimean War in 1856, the Middle Eastern markets of the Ottoman Empire were open to British or French capital, causing internal displacement or loss of land. Profiteering from real estate and banking skyrocketed, and a strong comprador bourgeoisie emerged alongside a more locally oriented capitalist class. Naturally, the emergence of the doctrine of nationalism is closely related to the development of capitalist relations both as a byproduct of cultural homogenization through large-scale production and infrastructure and as a means of the capitalist class to paint themselves as the representatives of the whole people. However, whereas nationalism takes on a chauvinist character among powerful, oppressing nations, the emergence of nationalist ideas in dominated nations is crucially determined by the oppression of the imperialist or colonialist power. Thus, the intelligentsia in Palestine would join others in the Arab world in formulating a national doctrine, which led them to struggle for more autonomy within and soon for independence from the Ottoman Empire. Palestine appeared on the maps around the world as a living country, with Palestinians speaking their own dialect, with their own customs and rituals. Along with nationalism, there came the idea of secularism, in the Arab world, Jewish, Christian and Muslim people saw themselves as part of the same national identity and arranged themselves on the basis of a shared territory, language, culture and history. If it wasn't for the rise of Zionism, this would have remained the case for Palestine as well. So contrary to the Israeli story, Palestine was not an empty and desolate land waiting to come into bloom. It was a rich and thriving Eastern Mediterranean place, undergoing the processes of modern capitalist development and nationalization, with all the benefits and tragedies that come with it. Palestine could have followed the path of Lebanon or Syria, if it wasn't for its colonization by the Zionist movement, which interrupted this process and turned it into a disaster for the indigenous people of Palestine. Toward the latter half of the 19th century, there were a great number of American and European missionaries spreading the idea of modernization, such as the Swiss Calvinist Samuel Goba. Over 3,000 books on Palestine were written by Europeans during that period, painting Palestine as a primitive land to be redeemed by Europeans. Many Christians at the time supported the idea of the Jews returning to the Holy Land as a nation one day, 
because it's part of the divine scheme for the end of time, going along with the second coming of the Messiah, this time not as a suffering servant, but as a conqueror king of kings with the armies of heaven on his side. The history of Christianity is closely intertwined with the history of anti-Semitism. Especially among the Protestants, there was a strong link between the notion of the end of the millennium and the conversion of the Jews and their return to Palestine. Thomas Brightman, a 16th century English clergyman, and many like him, wanted the Jews to either convert to Christianity or leave Europe. Shall they return to Jerusalem again? There is nothing more certain. The prophets do everywhere confirm it and beat about it. Second President of the United States, the Christian John Adams, stated, I really wish the Jews again in Judea as an independent nation. Napoleon Bonaparte, for instance, had been influenced by a prominent Catholic writer and politician who thought the Jews were the legitimate masters of Judea. When the French invaded the Arab world in 1799, Napoleon issued a proclamation to offer Palestine as a homeland to Jews under the protection of France in order to establish French influence in the region. His vision did not succeed, but it didn't die. It would soon materialize under the British. Zionism, as you can see, was a Christian colonial project before it became a Jewish one. The leading proponent of Christian Zionism, Anthony Ashley Cooper, or the Lord of Shaftesbury, played an essential role in the British ruling class eventually adopting Zionism. He wrote, quote, The Jews must be encouraged to return in yet greater numbers and become once more the husbandmen of Judea and Galilee. Though admittedly a stiff-necked, dark-hearted people, and sunk in moral degradation, obduracy, and ignorance of the gospel, they are not only worthy of salvation, but also vital to Christianity's hope of salvation. The first British consulate opened in 1838 in Jerusalem, encouraging Jews to come to Palestine. Its most famous early consul was James Finn, who wrote openly for the first time about the possible displacement of Palestinians. Finn, who absolutely hated Islam, organized the purchase of lands and real estates for missionaries and businesses. Colonizing Palestine wasn't an exclusive Zionist idea at the time. The German Temple Movement, which also had its influence on the early settler colonialism in North America, became especially interested in rebuilding a Jewish temple in Jerusalem to bring about redemption and absolution, convinced of precipitating the second coming of the Messiah. Senior members of the Royal Prussian Court enthusiastically supported their doctrine. The Templars founded several colonies in Palestine, until they were kicked out in 1948 by the new Jewish state. From the 1880s, at roughly the same time as the missionaries, the first wave of Zionist settlement began after preparation in Eastern Europe. In Zionist speak, this wave is referred to as the first Aliyah. To this day, moving to the land of Israel is referred to as making Aliyah, which means ascent. Moving to Palestine is seen as an act that elevates Jews to a higher form of existence. Hence, emigrating from Israel is called Yerida which means descent. Making Aliyah to this day is possible for any Jew around the world. If you convert to Judaism, you can easily move into Israel, though if you grew up there but you're Palestinian, you can't. All to ensure the Jewish majority goal, of course. These early settlers looked upon themselves as Haludzim, pioneers, comparing themselves to white settlers who pushed into the West in North America. One of the most famous Zionists of those supposed pioneers was Leon Pinsker, founder of Hovevi Zion, lovers of Zion. In his writings, he argued that antisemitism is not a temporary phenomenon, but, quote, an inherited aberration of the human mind, and that destroying it, quote, can only be in vain. He thus concluded that the proper and only remedy would be the creation of a Jewish nationality, of a people living upon its own soil. The international Jewish question must receive a national solution. A large number of the estimated 25,000 first Aliyah settlers did not stay for very long, often suffering from hunger and disease. Israeli sociologist and crucial contributor to the study of settler colonialism, Gershon Shafir, explains in his seminal book from 1989 how first Aliyah settlers struggled with establishing pure colonies and sought the help of the Rothschild banking family. 
aided by French experts, Edmond de Rothschild modeled colonies around the French colonization in North Africa, mainly around vineyards, using local seasonal labor. The pure colony model aims at the removal of the indigenous population and create an economy based on white labor, establishing ethnic homogeneity. Whereas mixed colonies or the plantation model of the Portuguese in colonial Brazil, for instance, used slave labor from the native population, here the colonizing ethnicity merely controls the land but doesn't want to work on it. This state of affairs changed with the second Aliyah and the arrival of the pseudo-socialist Zionists, who were not happy with that, since they wanted to have Jewish labor and not the cheap Arab labor which many Jewish employers tended to favor. Settler colonialism is a form of colonialism where foreign settlers arrive in a country with the intent of taking it over. So their arrival is actually an invasion. It differs from classical colonialism in several respects. Firstly, settlers rely only initially on the bigger empire for their survival. Sometimes, as in South Africa or Palestine, the settlers do not belong to the same nation as their imperial partners. Then, they usually form a separate entity by ceding from the mother country, often through struggle. Second, while classical colonialism is usually predominantly interested in extracting resources from their possessions, settler colonialism strives to take over the land in a foreign country by eliminating the people already living there. Patrick Wolfe, a leading scholar of settler colonialism, calls this the logic of elimination. The logical consequence of settler colonialism is to accomplish their goals by either genocide, ethnic cleansing, a form of apartheid, or all of the three together. This is important to understand. While Zionism is one particular form of settler colonialism, it is comparable to all other settler colonial projects in history. But gradual infiltration proved to be a failure in colonizing Palestinian land. What was needed was an institution aiming at the creation of a state. Soon, those Zionists in Europe who thought the first Aliyah settlements were too slow would meet and shape the history of Palestine forever. In late August of 1897, in the city of Basel, northwest of Switzerland, the first Zionist Congress was convened and chaired by the aforementioned founding father of political Zionism, Theodor Herzl, the second most important Zionist in history so far. Herzl initially planned to have the Congress in Munich in Germany, but the Jewish community leadership there, Orthodox and Reform, didn't like his ideas at all. Reform Judaism is a major Jewish denomination that emphasizes the importance of ethical over ceremonial aspects. In various conferences, its adherents rejected the Zionist idea. At a conference in Frankfurt, rabbis decided to delete all prayers for a return to Zion from the ritual. The Pittsburgh Conference in 1885 stated, quote, We consider ourselves no longer a nation, but a religious community, and we therefore expect neither a return to Palestine, nor the restoration of any laws concerning the Jewish state. Famous leader Rabbi Kaufmann Kohler, rejected the idea that Judea is the home of the Jew, an idea which unhomes the Jew all over the wide earth. An American reform rabbi compared Zionists like Herzl to charlatan alchemists claiming to be scientific. Austrian rabbi Adolf Jelinek, who just like Herzl was from Vienna, said that Zionism endangers the standing of European Jews, saying most of them rejected and declared, we are at home in Europe. Liberal Jews at the time mostly rejected Zionism as well. And more importantly, there was intense opposition from Jewish socialists, but more on that in the next part. In Basel, the delegates to the Congress adopted the Hatikva as its anthem, which was already the anthem of the lovers of Zion and later became the national anthem of the State of Israel. More importantly, they formulated the Basel program, which stated, quote, Zionism seeks to establish a home for the Jewish people in Palestine, secured under public law. And with this, it cemented the political Zionist vision, which now came to replace the more gradual, loosely organized approach in colonizing Palestine. Theodor Herzl wrote in his diary a few days later, quote, At Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I said this out loud today, I would be greeted by universal laughter. In five years, perhaps, and certainly in 50 years, everyone will perceive it. <laughs>
If he was alive today, he would surely think that he had the last laugh. Theodor Herzl was born in 1860 in Vienna. He was a journalist and tried being a good playwright until his death. He was highly ambitious and perceived by many as charismatic, sometimes called King of the Jews. In 1896, he wrote Der Judenstaat, probably the most important Zionist piece of writing. Now, in English, this pamphlet is translated as the Jewish state, which is technically an incorrect translation, and this is not just a minor pedantic quibble. Judenstadt would correctly be translated as the Jews' state, and it more closely reflects Herzl's ideology, namely, to have a state for Jews. He didn't bother too much with it being Jewish, about Judaic culture, and he couldn't even read Hebrew. According to him, the Jews didn't need their own culture or language. First and foremost, they needed a state. Herzl, much like most other important Zionists at the time, was not really religious, nor a national liberator as Zionists claim. He was just an old-fashioned colonizer liberal. He opposed the romantic, idealist interpretation of other nationalists and favored Friedrich Nietzsche's individualist will-to-power realism and the view that, quote, conflict is essential to man's highest efforts. Thus, only state power can and should break all obstacles in front of it. What is key here in the development of what Zionism is in its actual political manifestations is that Herzl was persuasive in proposing not to merely rely on gradual infiltration and cultural considerations, like some other Zionist currents back then, well aware that indigenous resistance would not let that happen. Quote, Gradual infiltration is bound to end badly, for there comes the inevitable moment when the government in question, under pressure of the native populace, which feels itself threatened, puts a stop to further influx of Jews. Immigration, therefore, is futile unless it is based on our guaranteed autonomy. Zionism was now synonymous with this ideological thrust. The Zionist visionary could foresee what colonization really entails, writing in his diary, quote, we must expropriate gently the private property on the state assigned to us. We shall try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in the transit countries, while denying it employment in our country. The property owners will come over to our side. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. Herzl strongly opposed those who thought integration or assimilation of Jews in Europe can work, as antisemitism is a permanent problem. Quote, In the world as it is now, and will probably remain, for an indefinite period, might takes precedence over right. He thought antisemitism cannot be solved due to Jewish dependence on a country's economy. In the introduction, he writes, quote, Even if we were a nation of entrepreneurs, such as absurdly exaggerated accounts make us out to be, we should not require another nation to live on. We do not depend on the circulation of old commodities, because we produce new ones. The Zionist pseudo-socialists who would soon dominate the Zionist movement would come up with similar justifications. Herzl proposed turning anti-Semitism to the advantage of the Zionists' pursuit of power. Quote, Yes, we are strong enough to form a state. The governments of all countries, scourged by anti-Semitism, will be keenly interested in obtaining sovereignty for us. The Jewish state and Altneuland, Old New Land, are the two most important works by Herzl. Reading them is important for understanding the ideology. The title of the second one in Hebrew is special. Tel Aviv, reflecting the idea of a rebirth in the ancient Jewish land. When the city was founded in 1909 as a small settlement to the north of Jaffa, out of nowhere, there had been other suggestions, such as Herzliya, but it was named after Herzl's Altneuland. The important Israeli metropolis is also known as the White City, displaying that Tel Aviv would be a modern, clean place modeled on European cities as opposed to what the settlers of the Second Aliyah saw as the dirty Arab cities. And it was in this city where the settler pseudo-socialist leadership of the most important Aliyah, the second one, would make their plans for the first ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Theodor Herzl was not even keen on colonizing Palestine particularly. One other suggestion he had was Argentina. Other ideas were Cyprus, North America, Azerbaijan, or Egyptian Sinai as a stepping stone to Palestine. 
but British politicians such as British colonial secretary Joseph Chamberlain, whom he approached, rejected those ideas. In an attempt to find a place in the British Empire that wasn't already inhabited by white settlers, Chamberlain proposed a Jewish colony in today's Kenya, later called the Uganda Scheme. Although Herzl favored an area near Palestine, he eventually accepted this idea and recommended it to the 6th Zionist Congress in Basel in 1903, one year before his short life ended at 44. Though a majority voted for the Uganda scheme, a certain Chaim Weizmann, who would become the third most important Zionist so far, was not a fan of it. And after Herzl's death, the scientist would become the leader of the Zionist movement. In the next part, I'll explain why he was so important. Just a quick side info. As I was finishing up this video, longtime Social Democratic President of the Executive Council of Basel, Beat Jans, just became a Swiss Federal Council Minister, one of seven holding the highest executive office in Switzerland. I mention this because he held a speech at the 125th Zionist Congress last year, showing the sympathy of much of the supposed left wing in Europe with Zionist colonialism and apartheid. Now back to the main script. Now what's the biggest problem with just declaring an inhabited area on the map your territory? Well, it's the people already living there. After the Zionist Congress declared Palestine its homestead, the Palestinian leadership naturally felt threatened, and the indigenous population of Palestine would constitute the most fundamental problem the Zionists would have to face in the coming century. Yusuf Dia Pasha al Khalidi was the mayor of Jerusalem in 1899. Compelled by a sacred duty of conscience to express his concern that Zionism would jeopardize friendly relations between the Muslim, Christian, and Jewish communities, he wrote a letter to Zadok Khan, the chief rabbi of France, which would eventually reach Herzl. Quote, I flatter myself to think that I need not speak of my feelings towards your people. As far as the Israelites are concerned, I really do regard them as relatives of us Arabs. For us, they are cousins. We really do have the same father, Abraham, from whom we are also descended. We have almost the same language. It is these sentiments that put me at ease to speak frankly to you about the great question that is currently agitating your people. He spoke of the pure folly of Zionism to plan to take over Palestine, concluding with a plea, in the name of God, let Palestine be left alone. In the typical colonialist manner, portraying colonial conquest as benefiting everyone, Herzl replied to him, quote, in allowing immigration to a number of Jews bringing their intelligence, their financial acumen, and their means of enterprise to the country, no one can doubt that the well-being of the entire country would be the happy result. Colonialism can only be understood in tandem with the inevitable violent contradiction that arises with the colonized. Today, Israel and its supporters around the world deny at every point the very meaning and essence of the urge to resist. Any pushback by Palestinians is simply deemed as terrorism, whether it's Hamas rockets or a little boy throwing stones at tanks. Any act against the occupation is thus depoliticized. It's merely an act of rage and the desire to murder Jews. The early Zionists did not do this. To them, it was essential all Zionists understood what the indigenous population wants in order to prepare the conquest of its land. As aforementioned Zionist Zeev Jabotinsky put it, quote, Except for those who were born blind, the moderate Zionists realized long ago that it is utterly impossible to obtain the voluntary consent of the Palestine Arabs for converting Palestine from an Arab country into a country with a Jewish majority. My readers have a general idea of the history of colonization in other countries. I suggest that they consider all the precedents with which they are acquainted and see whether there is one solitary instance of any colonization being carried on with the consent of the native population. There is no such precedent. The native populations, civilized or uncivilized, have always stubbornly resisted the colonists. This is equally true of the Arabs. They feel at least the same instinctive jealous love of Palestine as the old Aztecs felt for ancient Mexico and the Sioux for their rolling prairies. We may tell them whatever we like about the innocence of our aims, watering them down and sweetening them with honeyed words to make them palatable. But they know what we want. <laughs>
and they will persist in resisting as long as there remains a solitary spark of hope that they will be able to prevent the transformation of Palestine into the land of Israel. The members of the Zionist organization would meet many times in order to commence the establishment of the institutions that would one day form the modern Jewish state of Israel. One such crucial meetup was the Second Zionist Congress in 1898, exactly one year after the first one, again in Basel. The three-day Congress established the Jewish Colonial Association, incorporated in London a year later, whose chief aim was to fund the successful migration of Jews to Palestine. Notice how several of these structures had the adjective colonial in it, something that Zionists would never mention today, where colonialism isn't as fancy to claim anymore. They later therefore had to rebrand it, calling it Bank Leumi, which is now the biggest and most powerful bank in Israel, with offices in the US, Switzerland or China. Herzl had big plans with such an organization, inspired by his The Jewish Company in the Jewish State, which, under the protection of England, would control all land in Palestine and transport millions of people there within a few years. There were two other important things happening in this Congress. The first was the presentation of an early prototype of today's flag of Israel. The other thing was something that no one could predict at the time would have a seminal impact on the history of Israel. It was the arrival of the first delegates of the so-called socialist Zionism, which will be the topic in the next part. This tendency was to become the most important Zionist current, dominating the history of Palestine for almost a century giving Israel, to this day, the veal of democracy and progressivism. At its helm, the most important Zionist in history, leading Israel for four decades, bastardizing socialism in the name of the superior nation, culminating in the planning of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. The beginning of the to this day never-ending catastrophe, named by Palestinians, the Nakba.